Hello, Miss Noel Kennedy White at the Browning School in New York City, fourth grade teacher. I have a question for you. How does it feel abusing nine-year-old children? How does it feel causing nine-year-old children permanent and probably incurable psychological trauma for the rest of their lives? You like that? You like getting up in the morning and putting on your pantsuit and day after day abusing little children the way you do? Whether they be white or black or Hispanic. Because very, very explicitly, clearly, that's what you've devoted your life to, as you've very proudly stated in black and white. Let's look at that, shall we? Firstly, it says here you earned a master's degree of education. Thus, you are very fluent learned and skilled in the techniques and consequences of relating ideas to humans, let alone very small, tender children who have basically no ability to discern right from wrong or understand the consequences of ideas that are being permanently inculcated in their very soft brains. Okay, medical definition of psychological child abuse. Emotional child abuse includes acts of commission or omission by the parents and other caregivers, such as yourself, that could cause the child to have serious behavioral, emotional, or mental disorders. There it is, in a nice crisp box. Now let's see what you uh, have devoted your life to in black and white. This is your writing. You want to, these children, give them the tools to tackle deep and important social issues. In your professional master's degree of education opinion, you think fourth grade children are able to be given tools to tackle deep, important societal issues? Yeah? You say, with proper guidance and instructions, your fourth graders could discuss complex and nuanced topics such as slavery, revolution, immigration, and otherness. Hmm. Well, you know, I'm actually a professional teacher, too. I've devoted my life to teaching not slavery, revolution, immigration, and otherness to nine-year-olds, but critical thought. I'm a chess teacher. In my professional opinion, I submit that they are in no way ready to understand issues such as slavery, revolution, immigration, and otherness. But let's put that on hold for now and continue with what you believe. You say, an initial year-long essential question was, are all men created equal? Kids initially said, yes, of course. But then after your teaching and shaping in your professional master's degree of education way, you said this evolved into a, yes, but not everyone is treated equally. And then it continued from there. You explained to them that your standardized test scores to get into Georgetown, the same place I went, were probably on par with my scores, even though you're a black woman and I'm a white male. Now I'm taking a guess here, I don't know your test scores, but I'll guess because I'm a wild gambler. I will bet my life that my test scores are higher than your scores. And we all know that because we do not live in an equal society. We live in a society where black people get preferential treatment everywhere they go. And you are living proof of that. By all the free handouts you've gotten from the day you were born by our kind society, through your preferential treatment by your teachers, by the police, right up to this very day, how you are allowed to accrue a title abusing children because of the color of your skin and your gender. I guess even though it is such a perfect living example to share with your kids, I guess you didn't share that with them for certain reasons that we will get to later. Now, regarding your discussion on slavery, since you wanted to give them a, quote, wide range of settings and to expand their horizons and worldview, I'm sure you talked most about Africa because Africa has by far been the countries and continent that has, for the last 2,000 years, enthusiastically promoted slavery in its governments, and even today is the leading place on Earth that has the most current slaves per capita. You told this to your children, right? Because if you didn't, that would clearly reveal an agenda by you. Let's actually talk about slave facts, and I'm sure you told your children. 100% of major cultures in human history have practiced slavery. 
You told them that, right? You told them that the word slave comes from the word Slav because the white Slavic people, such as myself, by the way, so often suffered enslavement from Mongol, Arab, and white slave traders. You told them that 100% of major cultures in human history has practiced slavery because that seems to me very relevant in the discussion of slavery. And I'm sure you told them this. The total number of free Africans enslaved by whites was zero. Zero while the total number of free whites enslaved by Africans is approximately 1,500,000. You told them that although progressives indoctrinate that there occurred European slave raids in Africa, in truth there exists zero evidence of this, that logic concludes slavers were better off simply buying cheap slaves rather than undertaking risky complications of slave raids, you told them that, on the other hand, the North African Barbary pirates raided all of coastal Europe, far up including England and Iceland. You told them this, right? Because this is clearly very relevant. And I'm sure you told them that when the first African slave was sold to a European, a robust slave trade had already been erected for many centuries because you have taken upon yourself with your master's degree in education to discuss slavery with children. And you told them that while approximately 11 million African slaves were shipped to the Americas, only about 500,000 were shipped to North America. You told them that, right? Because you wouldn't want to give a disproportionately twisted narrative that America is evil and must be destroyed, right? That wouldn't be on your agenda. You did tell them that it was exactly European morality that ended slavery. I'm sure you told them that, right? Because clearly there is no one with half a brain that could deny that the culture that ended slavery would be a relevant piece to this narrative. Because if you didn't include this fact, that might be evidence of a very specific agenda to manipulate little kids and inculcate guilt and rage in them at nine years old. You did tell them that Denmark was the first to ban slavery in 1803, that Britain banned slave trade in 1807, and the practice of slavery in 1834, that the United States banned the slave trade in 1808 and the practice of slavery in 1865, that the British Navy, motivated only by exemplary morality, spent tremendous resources maintaining a decades-long blockade to stop the Atlantic slave trade, arresting many thousands of slave ships. Royal Navy Lieutenant Patrick Forbes estimated that during a period of 26 years, 103,000 slaves were set free because of British efforts? Did you have an assembly where kids in slave costumes were set free by other kids in white Englishman costumes and then they hugged and they thanked each other and then they went on into Africa and had glorious tales of those noble white men that for no other reason than morality set these black slaves free? You did tell them about that, right? While we're on this topic, you did indeed tell them that the African governments championed the slave trade. I'm sure you told them that, right, Noel? That in the early 19th century, King Gezu of what is present-day Benin stated, the slave trade has been the ruling principle for my people. It is the source of their glory and their wealth. Their songs celebrate their victories, and the mother lulls the child to sleep with notes of triumph of an enemy reduced to slavery. You let them know about that black king's quote there, right? Because these nine-year-old children are intellectually mature enough to appreciate these issues, right, Noel? With your master's degree in education? These African leaders were so against Europe's abolition of the slave trade that they actually sent delegates to London to protest, and that one delegate even insisted that his both oracle and the priests had told him that their god, as well as the Christian and Muslim gods, completely approved slavery. The white men in London refused the petition because their morality wanted to set black people free. Now, because you care so much about these kids, I'm absolutely positive you told them this. From 16 to 1800 in North America, one half to two thirds of whites entering America arrived as slaves in the form of indentured servants, if not direct slaves. You did tell them that, right? Because if you didn't say that, that would probably be criminal negligence and evidence of criminal child abuse in the severely maligning of a narrative to inculcate racism, guilt, and rage in little children. You did tell them that the term kidnapping originated from the English criminal practice kidnapping, stealing children to sell as slaves. 
Most were indentured servants, but the typical reality was that their masters manipulated their documents so they were enslaved permanently. Laws relating to fugitive black slaves equally applied to these whites. And I'm sure you told them this because you want to give them the correct, fair picture. You told these little children that at the beginning of the American Civil War, 98.6% of everybody in the North and the South did not own slaves. You told them that, right? If we interviewed some of these children, they would be like, oh yes, Noelle Kennedy White definitely told us that. She told us all these things. You definitely told these kids that many black Americans own slaves, right? I mean, what could be more important to the slavery narrative than to let people know that, for example, in New Orleans in 1860, over 3,000 free blacks, which is 28% of the black New Orleans population, owned slaves. And now this wasn't just blacks somehow freeing their family from slavery. No, absolutely not. There was many black slave magnets. And as a very responsible teacher who has the health of children and her nation in mind, you correctly let them know that one of these black slave magnets was named Antoine Dubouclet, who owned over 100 slaves. His sugarcane estate was valued at, in 1860 dollars, $264,000, while the average earnings of a white southerner at the time was $3,978. And you did also let these kids know that there was documented cases that free blacks felt suddenly so ill-equipped to provide for themselves in their state of freedom that they petitioned their former masters to once again become slaves. And finally, I'm sure you told your kids that while Africa has been practicing slavery for 2,000 years and continues to this day to be the leading practicer of slavery, America, on the other hand, practiced slavery for a total of 72 years. You did tell them this, right? Because without telling them all these facts, you'd be painting a very false narrative depicting white people and America as abominable monsters, which would result in inculcated rage in the black kids and inculcated guilt in the white kids due to a radically false narrative. I'm sure you didn't do that because you have a master's of education. And if you did that, you'd be criminally negligent as well as guilty of textbook child abuse and you'd go to jail. It seems nine-year-old little children are mature enough to talk about revolution. Really? You know, looking at this slavery, revolution, immigration, and otherness, one wonders what topics you think a nine-year-old couldn't grasp. Because I can think of little more complicated topics than these topics. Revolution, huh, Noel? I'm sure you discussed major revolutions such as the Russian Revolution in approximately 1917, in which insane Marxist Bolsheviks overthrew a struggling but functioning order of society. Many hundreds of thousands of people died brutal deaths. Finally, the Bolsheviks established a new government based on social justice, bread and peace in which millions of people died through starvation, not to mention the incomprehensible psychological torture of being unallowed to speak freely, of wondering if your best friends and your family members would tell the secret police that you didn't love communism, and thus you were ripped from your children in the middle of the night by police and sent to gulags unless you were lucky enough to be shot in the head. You did discuss this with these nine-year-old children, right? Because they have the minds to grasp this. I guess you talked with them about the reign of terror during the French Revolution that was aimed to bring social justice and equality and economic redistribution. You discussed Robespierre and his arresting of 300,000 people, many thousands of which were guillotined, many more thousands which died waiting trial in their jail cells. I'm sure you discussed this with them, right? You talked about Jean-Baptiste's rounding up of priests, scholars, and counter-revolutionaries putting them in a barge in the middle of the Loire and sinking the barge, thereby drowning them. You did share this with these nine-year-old children because they are old enough and intellectually mature enough to understand revolution, right? I guess you talked about Che Guevara, the famous revolutionary, but you probably have a silk green t-shirt of handsome him in his beret looking up. I guess you told your children about how he, in front of his friends, raped a servant on his dinner table and then afterwards kept right on eating. You did tell them about that, right? Because they're mature enough for these things, revolution. You did tell them of the mass ongoing shooting during the Cuban revolution and how to this day people are not allowed to speak freely there. 
how their information is extremely radically censored, how their health care is radically subpar, how many people each year drown in pathetic makeshift boats trying to leave Cuba for America, though America is a capitalistic republic. I'm sure you shared all of this, right? It's revolution. I'm sure you shared with them the various Central American revolutions in the last hundred years and how so many of them fought for revolution and then once the revolution occurred, they then were so dismayed at the results that they switched sides and started fighting against the people that they were fighting for just months ago. You shared that with these nine-year-olds, right? Because you have your masters of education and they can handle things such as revolution. And I see here you discussed immigration with them. I see you showed them a book about a young Mexican girl trying to help her family survive during the Great Depression. I'm not sure what that has to do with immigration at all, but I'm sure that you did discuss immigration correctly. All the myriad complicated issues evolved in the umbrella issue of immigration. I'm sure if you have these nine-year-olds, you talked about the moral and legal sovereignty of a nation's borders. You talked about the utterly moral right people have of self-determination. You talked about the economic consequences of bringing droves and droves of immigrants into the United States. You talked about the diseases people carry being thrust together, the crime, the social tension. You talked about the importance to assimilate, to speak the national language, to believe in the principles of incoming country, how obviously moral it is to demand such assimilation. You talked about the consequences of bringing in people who are uneducated and unwilling to assimilate into our culture. You talked about when people from Central America are seeking asylum, which is very, very different than just wanting to come for a better life, that international law demands that they seek asylum in the first safe country they come across, such as Mexico, if you're coming through Central America. Because if you were to just go all the way through Mexico, and enter America illegally, you'd be exhibiting selfishness on your desire for a better life over respecting the integrity, the sovereign borders, and immigration policy that protects the moral sovereign good people of that nation. And how there are 190 other countries on earth people can go to if they don't want to come to America. Clearly, you talked to these nine-year-olds about this because you boasted this in your paper. I'm sure you talked about the consequences of different races, the cultural clash, and the mathematically necessary destruction of the native culture. Not only the radical injustice, but also the forever psychological damage that would do to the native people. I'm sure you told this to your nine-year-olds. Because if you didn't, that would reveal clearly that you had an agenda that you are manipulating little nine-year-old minds to believe a sick version of reality, explicitly against the principles of the United States, such as that there are no borders, as well as the people of this nation have no right to enforce their borders, as well as people here, especially white people, somehow hate non-white people, and thus those white people are thereby deemed immoral and they can be destroyed as well as their culture. You wouldn't want to inculcate that, would you? Because that would be an indescribably heinous evil, Noel Kennedy White. You do understand that, right? If you neglected all of these obvious facts and ideas that I've mentioned in the last half hour, you would be very clearly, beyond any reasonable doubt, either in a court of law or in a court of moral law, guilty of evil so heinous it would be qualitatively indescribable by inculcating these little children with such rage and guilt and shame for their ethnicity and their nation. Because if you didn't say all this and your goal was for these children struggling to achieve a more just society, they begin to think about their own role in doing the same, clearly you will be succeeding in brainwashing these very little children if the minorities to grow up hating white people and their country and have a lifelong urge to destroy it, which probably will lead to communism and the true hell on earth that that brings. Or if they're white children, they will grow up to feel permanent, intractable guilt, shame, void of self-esteem, which will lead to lives of sorry, empty passivity and despair, depression, and possibly suicide. 
you wouldn't want to be doing this because you know better, right? Because you have a master's degree in education and you went to Georgetown. Though you know, because I have been around the block a time or two, I've met other people like you. And it continues to be so sad that you do not have the health of these little children as a priority. Obviously, you want to indoctrinate these little children with your deeply evil, sick, cultural Marxist version of reality, which sees society not as an innocent, multifaceted jazz of humanity, but as a heinous war of oppressors and oppressed. One that, despite all the white people have done, all that America has done for everyone, time and time and time again, 620,000 people killed in the Civil War, the culture that liberated slavery, the culture that thought separate but equal would work, and when it didn't, they reversed it, a culture that has given trillions of dollars to minorities, a culture that has tolerated riots, murder, and lies of oppression, and that is what you promote with your life's work here on planet Earth. You and most every other academic in New York City. And then you go to your cocktail parties with your noses so high in the air and discuss your moral superiority in your quest for social justice. A justice of theft from others, lack of reward for hard work, lack of respect for democratic law, lack of respect for reality, for truth, a world where you judge people by the color of their skin. Not in the one time that you should, on the whole, with race realism, but all the other times. Who should get into college? Who should get into Browning? Who should teach at Browning? Who should be teaching how to discuss race in Browning? I just don't understand how you can live your life abusing little children. These kids may never recover from the abuse that you inflict upon them daily. How the hell do you live with yourself? Noel Kennedy White, you are morally and legally guilty of child abuse and you are a minion of heinous, pure evil.